So hello everyone. Welcome to another lecture organized by A Action. A Action is a project that started amongst the AA community that shared the same concern about architectural pedagogy in the context of climate change. A few of us actually wrote um, the architectural education declares, which pointed out multiple aspects that need to alter. So ranging from climate literacy to decolonizing education. And over the past year, we've been committed to bringing about a necessary pedagogical and cultural shift in architectural education in order to effectively work towards climate justice. And this lecture series had been another attempt for us to build alliances with a broader community. As we've been facing such an uncertain time with COVID-19, more than ever, it seems like we've been questioning how we can feed the cities we live in and the life afterwards. So we're very pleased to have Carolyn Steele with us today, who will be discussing with us the topic of food security in a time like this, and the relationship between food and infrastructure, uh, which sculpt our networks. Jean? Yeah. So um, just looking at student projects at DAA will tell you that um, the food provision and how these systems are challenged in the time of climate uncertainty and climate instability. Uh, it shows that it's an increasingly pressing subject. And whether we look at flooded fields, destructive droughts, devastating locust plays, uh, urban farms or acidification of the ocean, food security is already compromised and that's the case in all the countries of the world. And as Eugene just said, the coronavirus actually highlighted a lot of the fragility of these systems. And so we need to radically shift the relation we have with food, but also how we design food provision systems. And obviously architects have a huge role to play with this. And so um, Caroline is an architect who has been researching and writing about these subjects for years, uh, specifically through her book, which has received a lot of praise. And it's a great honor for me to welcome her for this talk. And I hope you all enjoy this. If you have any questions, just write them in the chat box and I'll select them and read them out, read them out at the end. Thank you. Over to me? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thanks very much for having me. Great pleasure to be here and, uh, you know, welcome to Lockdown London from wherever you are. Um, I'm going to share my screen with you and, uh, and then exactly as Jean just said, I'm going to try to explain why um, basically food is an amazing uh, tool with which we can uh, think about not only the enormous uh, challenges and crises we faced up until two months ago, but the one that we also face now. Um, and I'm going to begin, I guess, with, with uh, my, my concept of Cytopia. I'm going to explain what that is a little bit later. But I'd like to start by asking you to just contemplate this landscape here. Um, and to really tell me what you see, um, and I stopped talking to let you look at it for a little while, but basically, um, if you're anything like me, when I first saw this, this image when I was about 18, when I was an architecture student, what you predominantly see is a city on the left-hand side um, and a landscape on the right-hand side, a landscape in, indeed that sort of is in harmony with the city. Um, and in the middle, you see this kind of rather dramatic um, red wall dividing the two halves of the image. Um, and, oh, sorry, fiddle, fiddle. Let's see if that, okay, I have to do this. Um, and I, this is the context in which you see this image. I don't know if some of you know it already, but it actually sits on one wall of the town hall in Siena. So this is the so-called Sala de Nove, which is the Hall of Nine in Siena. Um, and in fact, if you look out of the window of this room, you can see a landscape very like the one that's depicted in this image. And it's called, you can see here, it's called the allegory of the effects of good government. So basically this is a kind of didactic image that's sitting in the town hall and it's basically trying to remind the city elders that, you know, this is what a good government looks like. It's a government in which the city and the countryside are in balance. Um, and that makes you sort of look at the image again and realize that, you know, something that I certainly didn't immediately pick up, which now seems to me incredible, um, is that this image is actually all about food. 
because it's food that connects the city and the countryside. And in fact, if you look at the image closely, you can see, for example, a group of huntsmen leading the city to maybe go and shoot a boar. You see a landscape that's very orderly. It's actually not a natural landscape. It's a modified landscape that's been changed in order to feed the city. Um, you can see asses coming in with grain on their backs. Um, you can see a pig being driven to market, people working very hard in the landscape. And then inside the city, a flock of sheep being driven around, a woman with a basket of eggs on her head, another one carrying a fowl and so on. So it makes you reassess what you might have not seen before, which is that we live in a world shaped by food. And not only that, but this wall, ooh, sorry, I didn't mean to do that. Um, sorry, I'll get hang this in a minute. This wall, um, which seems like a very radical division in the image, is actually a membrane. And what is passing from one side to the other of this image all the time is trade. Uh, and food is a principal element of that trade. Um, now, once you realize that we live in a world shaped by food, um, it becomes quite an interesting question to ask, well, why don't we kind of see that every day? And one of the reasons for that is that basically we don't actually see the landscapes that feed us anymore. I mean, if you look at, a, um, at what might be a sort of modern version of the Lawrence Setti, like this, these two images I've juxtaposed here, um, you know, London is my hometown, I've lived here all my life. I don't think I thought seriously for the first, you know, 40 years of my life how the, how the food that fed London actually came into the city, which now seems extraordinary to me now. Um, but of course, the landscapes that feed London, uh, as I say, they're not visible from London itself. They're often thousands of miles away and they're often very denatured landscapes like this one on the right that you wouldn't necessarily um, want to paint and stick on a wall, even if you could. Um, and I call this the urban paradox. And the reason I call it that is that we think of ourselves as urban animals. We talk of ourselves as urban, you know, we think of ourselves as living in cities, but actually in a very real sense, we, we dwell in nature because we're animals and we need sustenance from the natural world. And the paradox is that the more we gather together in cities in order to be together, the further away we get from our sources of sustenance. Um, so in a sense, there's a kind of inherent duality. And I think, you know, if our job as architects is to ask the question, how should we dwell as humans, you know, what is a good uh, place for a human being to live, then, you know, I think it's very interesting to bring in this, this term that Aristotle, that's Aristotle in the middle there, that Aristotle came up with. He called us political animals. Um, and I find this a very useful term because of what it does is it actually describes a kind of inherent duality that we have to face essentially because we need society on the one hand and nature on the other hand and you know so the question is then if you like what is the ideal landscape or ideal scenario for a, a political animal to live in and <laughs> um and you know one answer to that is that we we might have thought that we'd created such a scenario because we can live in cities and yet you know we'd all got used to this business of being able to walk into a supermarket and to see this amazing cornucopia of food just kind of you know flooding in and and you know it, it, it would have appeared i think to many of us uh up till about two or three months ago that you know the problem of feeding cities if you like had been solved um mm -hmm. Sorry, I keep doing that because I, uh, anyway, never mind. Um, and then, of course, this happened. Um, the COVID-19 so-called panic buying. I mean, I think it's an interesting question whether or not it was exactly that. But nevertheless, there was a surge of demand on a system that was actually inherently extremely fragile because it was based on a, a very predictable um, uh, sort of consuming order which was then interrupted by unforeseen circumstances and I think for a lot of people this was extremely shocking um, I mean it was even shocking for me and you know I kind of already knew that the food system was pretty fragile um, so so this makes you think you know in a bigger way about 
this question of what it is to dwell and whether actually we had so brilliantly solved the question of how to feed cities after all. Um, and for me, you know, the question sort of then becomes sort of one of actually, you know, what really is civilization and what does it mean, you know, to, to live well and all the rest of it. And I think if you go back to the beginning of, of our journey, our human journey, what becomes very clear is that, you know, there's always been one overriding question um, that we've always tried to solve. And, and that really is how should you eat? Um, because feeding ourselves every day is arguably the biggest shared problem that we face. And we've got better and better at kind of inventing technologies that help us to do it. So the most fundamental and important one was the discovery of fire. Um, this basically happened, nobody really quite knows, but somewhere between one and a half and two million years ago, we think. But the invention of fire was fundamental because it allowed us to, if you like, make a home in the landscape rather than just following the food around, which we used to do. And it allowed us to start cooking our food, which meant that we could load up on calories much more easily than we had been able to do before, which in turn meant that we could start to specialise in hunting. So certain people could leave the camp uh, every day and go hunting, knowing that even if they failed, because hunting is a high risk activity, they could come back to a cooked meal at the end of the day. And so I often say that you hunt, I cook is the oldest social contract in human civilization because it's a division of labor that actually makes life better than the sum of its parts. And of course, when the tribe would come back together at the end of the day in order to share the spoils of their day's labors, they would do it around a shared meal. Um, and I also think, believe that the shared meal is not only the first human economy, but also the best we've ever invented because we're very, very good at sharing through food. And in fact, we evolved language um, and we evolved a kind of a whole way of being together, a kind of holding back and celebrating success through the way we share food. So it's a highly sophisticated, highly visible, highly flexible economy. And the way we eat has also shaped the way we live through time. So again, for most of our history as humans, we didn't live in cities. Um, in fact, I often say we used to live in the larder. So we used to basically follow the food around. Um, and here we have this wonderful image uh, by Rubens of you know, paradise. Um, in the good old days before we farmed and lived in cities and so on. Um, and this was, as I say, a peripatetic existence because basically people would, you know, go where the food was, um, you know, pick a sort of a landscape, clean if you like, pull all of the fruit off the trees and so on, and then move on. Um, so it was a kind of a mobile existence. And that all changed probably sometime around 12,000 years ago when actually there was the last great climate crisis to hit the world, known as the end of the last ice age, when a lot of areas uh, started to heat up. Um, this is an image of the so-called Fertile Crescent. Uh, it's also happening in the Indus Valley around the same time, but that rich forest that people had been living in began to recede northwards. Um, and there was a population explosion because it was getting warmer but there was also a lot less food around and people desperately had to find a new way of feeding themselves. And they came up with this brilliant idea of cultivating grass, basically. So we began to farm, we began to plant seeds, we began to produce grain. Um, and if you think about what it takes to feed a population when you're farming, as opposed to when you're hunting and gathering, the crucial difference is that when you're farming, you have to stay in one place because you've invested work in the land and you want to be there when the grain becomes ripe, because if you're not, somebody else will nick it. So basically, we get these kind of um, settled farming communities along the eastern coast of the Mediterranean and in what was Anatolia, now modern Turkey. And then eventually a group of those that are complex enough to be considered cities. So basically what this diagram tells you is that farming and urbanity co-evolved um, and that grain is basically the only food that we've ever discovered capable of feeding large non-food producing populations, i.e. urban populations. So it's the food of cities. 
So if we look at what those early cities were like, we discover some interesting things. The first is that they're very small. So this is about something like, you know, 500 meters across only, the city of Ur, it's on a river, um, which obviously brings uh, fertility, but also the possibility of irrigating land. It's surrounded by farmland. Um, and in the middle, there is this large temple complex. Um, and actually it turns out that the temples of old cities were not only the spiritual hub of the city, but also the administrative hub. So they actually organized the annual harvest, which was the most important event for the city. Um, and they would gather in the, the grain, uh, offer it up to the gods in the ziggurat, store it in the temple granary, cook it in the temple bakery, and then redistribute it through the city during the course of the year. So in modern terminology, if we were going to say, how did uh, the first cities ever built feed themselves, we would say they were city-states, so that's a blob of urbanity surrounded by countryside, and in the middle, the temple, if you like, represents what we would now call a large centralised food distribution hub. And it was a very, very successful model, and most ancient cities followed it. Um, and in fact, it sort of followed this principle that both Plato and Aristotle uh, sort of lauded, which was the self-sufficiency of the city. Uh, and they called it, oops, sorry, I seem to keep doing crazy things with my mouse. Um, and they, they sort of privileged this idea that essentially um, the city would be able to feed itself. And they called it oikonomia. And that just means household management. And the idea is that every citizen would ideally have a house in the city and a farm in the countryside and the farm would feed the house and therefore the household would be self-sufficient. So this is oikonomia from oikos, which is house, and nomos, which is management. And then if everybody did that, then the city itself would be self-sufficient. And this for both Plato and Aristotle was the ideal for the city. And indeed they said, um, once the city had enough division of labor inside it to be able to do everything it needed to do, um, then that was, it shouldn't grow any bigger. So there was this idea of keeping the city small. And as I say, every sort of ancient city pretty much followed that model until this one came along. So this is Rome, um, which by the first century AD had an estimated million citizens. This is a huge, huge metropolis in terms of the ancient world. So now I'd like to ask you if you have any idea about how you think Rome fed itself. So I'm just going to give you a little moment to wonder about that. I don't know whether anyone's going to write in a sort of answer on the chat thing or anything. Any ideas? Shall I tell you? <laughs> the answer is by food miles. Oh dear, I can't stop that. Food miles. So we think of food miles as a modern phenomenon. I, I don't know whether you've all heard the term, but basically food miles is the idea that is basically an expression of how far your food has come in before it sort of feeds you. Um, and it's actually a term invented by Tim Lang, um, a sort of uh, English food uh, policy professor um, to describe the modern world, but actually it's an ancient phenomenon too. So for example, if we look at this map of Rome, um, we can see that the city was importing food from all over the Mediterranean, the Black Sea, the North Atlantic coast. It was even importing fresh oysters from London at a certain point. And the reason it was able to do this was because it could import food over sea and it was about 50 times cheaper to do it over sea than over land. So for example, I mean, grain of course was the most important food of all. It was able to import its grain from the North Atlantic coast. Um, more easily than it could have imported grain from 20 miles outside the city, just in bringing it in over land, because grain was extremely heavy and bulky in relation to its value. So I guess the big takeaway from this map of Rome's food shed is what we would now call it, is that cities, even in the ancient world, had the capacity to shape the landscape a long, long way away from where they were. And not only that, but they had the capacity to suck nutrients out. So by 300 AD or so on, the soils of North Africa were actually severely depleted because all of the nutrients had been sucked out to feed Rome and they hadn't been put back. So effectively, you might say that sort of Rome fed itself to death. Sometimes that works, sometimes it doesn't. I haven't worked out why. Anyway, 
Um, now, the first person to analyse the productive hinterland of a city was a German called Johann von Thunen. He wrote a book in 1826 called The Isolated State. And here what von Thunen was asking is, how would the productive hinterland of a city naturally arrange itself? Um, basically, if the city was in uh, the isolated state was a flat, fertile, featureless plain. And he said, well, occupied by logical profit-seeking farmers. Um, so he said, well, the city would be surrounded by market gardens because fruit and vegetables were very difficult to transport long distances because they would squash easily and go off easily. So they needed to be close to the city. They were also luxury food, so the farmers could afford the, the high land rents near to the city. And last but not least, the farmers could make very good use of so-called night soil, which is human and animal manure, which was collected from the city and dumped on the land. So you got a nice little synergetic loop of the nutrients being recycled, as they were not with Rome. You then got something like a 20 to 30 mile band of grain production, also including the growing of firewood and so on. And the reason it couldn't be any bigger than that was because I was just saying grain was very heavy and bulky in relation to its value. So beyond about 30 miles, it would have been economically unviable to try to bring the grain in over land. So this effect, the outskirts, you would have livestock production because the animals could walk into market. Um, and the only concession that Fontunen made to geography was to say that if the city was on a navigable river, represented by this blue wiggly line here, then all of those bands could be a lot further away because you could then, as it were, take the grain to the river and bring it in that way, which was much easier. Now that's all incredibly abstract. It actually gets a lot more interesting when you look at a real city. Um, and here are two real cities, uh, my home city of London on the left and the city of Paris on the right. And again, just to ask you a little quiz, I'm going to ask you whether you can notice any obvious difference between these two images. And the answer is that on the left-hand side in London, you have ocean-going vessels, ocean-going ships, and on the right-hand side in Paris, you only have river barges. And this is major because it means that London was able to, like Rome had done, it was able to trade by sea to bring food in from wherever it wanted. It developed, developed a kind of free trade attitude to feeding itself. Um, indeed, I often say that this geographical difference explains Brexit, although I have to say I don't think anything does explain Brexit, <laughs> moving swiftly on. But Paris, on the other hand, was not able to do that because the Seine was not navigable by ocean-going ships. So instead it had to impose these so-called provisioning rings on the countryside and demand um, that grain was brought into the city, often by force. And at the head of the so-called grain police in Paris, which was this huge hierarchy that organized this, this extracting of grain on behalf of the city was the king. Um, and it's not accidental, by the way, that this kind of different, very different uh, attitude to feeding itself led to uh, a very different politics. Um, so the king, Louis the Sixteenth, who's shown in this cartoon here, was the baker of last resort. He was supposed to feed the people. And when he was unable to do that in the 1780s because of a series of failed harvests, he was blamed, essentially. Um, and this cartoon is depicting him being sort of caught trying to flee the city because he was too greedy, as the popular story went, um, to save himself, you know, even he wouldn't feed his people and he was too greedy even to save his own skin. So he stopped to have a meal on the way out of the city and the police caught up with him. And uh, the cartoon is called uh, Fat Birds Fly Slowly. So I think if you want a lesson, and this is an important lesson, as to why politicians hate being responsible for feeding people, this is why. It's a very difficult thing to do, and it always goes wrong, or often goes wrong. Now, by contrast, as I say, London uh, was able to import food from all over the place from very early on, and indeed it did. Indeed, it was a Roman city, so it was already importing wine and olive oil and so on from the beginning. But you can also see how the city was nevertheless shaped by food. So you can see the market gardens surrounding it, the Fontune and talked about. You can see the grain coming in by river. 
um, because it's heavy and bulky, and then trying to make its way up into the center of the city to Cornhill where it was traded. And by the name of the street, Bread Street, you can see it was already being traded on the way up. Fish is obviously also coming in by river, coming into the two main river ports of Queenhithe and Billingsgate. Billingsgate was uh, the main fish market of London and as probably some of you know, remained the fish market until the 1980s. And this is something else very important about food is, is that once food ways were established, they, they're very difficult to shift for the obvious reason that basically uh, the food system, you know, the food has to keep coming. You can't just kind of stop it and kind of while you're worrying about something else. Um, and then in the last image, you see meat and meat was obviously walking into the market um, and Smithfield, which remains London's meat market today. So it's been there for over a thousand years. Um, it was a smooth field outside the city where the animals from Scotland and Wales would come walking down and that's where they would gather. Um, and in fact, if we look at that market, an image of that market while it was still a livestock market, you get some idea of why people living in the pre-industrial city actually did know where their food came from because it was kind of moving and bleaching and getting in the way. Um, and I call this necessary chaos because of course it was deeply chaotic to have <clears throat> excuse me, up to 10,000 animals arriving in the city at one time, which were then slaughtered in a whole series of unregulated slaughterhouses around the market. And then the waste was dumped in the Fleet River, which just stogged up and became extremely unpleasant. Um, so it was a very, very imperfect system, but at least it, it did make the food system visible, basically. And Although English kings and queens never took responsibility for feeding people, nevertheless, the city did regulate the food supply by making it visible like this. And that was basically a sort of snapshot of how cities fed themselves before the railways came along. So when the railways came along, three key things changed. So basically, for the first time, it's possible to transport food long distances rapidly. And this makes a big difference because basically up till now, Cities have been constrained as to how big they can be and where they can be because basically they were constrained by geography. Now they're emancipated from geography, so they can more or less be built anywhere and any shape. Secondly, politicians up to this point, one way or another, had controlled the food system and now they stopped controlling it. And basically, you know, food industries begin to take over the, the task of feeding cities. And last but not least, food which had been highly visible in the city now becomes invisible because food starts to travel down special logistical routes that are particular to it and actually it stops occupying the same physical space as the people eating the food. And we're living with the consequences of all of these changes. So this is just a graphic that shows you how rapidly cities begin to expand after the railways come. That's London in 1840. It's not much bigger than the medieval city. And then very, very rapidly it explodes once the railways arrive. Of course, the productive hinterland is also changing very rapidly. So this is the American Midwest before the railways. <clears throat> Grassland basically grazed by, it's estimated six, something like 60 million bison and of course Native Americans. When the railways come, the first thing people do is they exterminate the bison and they move the Native Americans onto reservations and learn, and they don't do anything, by the way, with the bison, they just pile the skulls up. And lo and behold, they have, you know, the kind of the, the nirvana of, of modern food production, which is basically grain monoculture, like the one that I've shown here. Uh, for the first time ever, there was a global grain glut um, so my next quiz for you is what do you do with grain when there's more of it than you can eat? And you're all looking a bit puzzled, so I'll tell you the answer. Well, you can see it in front of you. In fact, you, you feed it to animals. Um, so it's the beginning of cheap meat. It's the beginning of so-called meat packing, which is basically <clears throat> feeding animals uh, grain. Of course, as some of you probably know, um, actually cows aren't designed to eat grain. It, it makes them, it gives them indigestion basically because they, their stomachs evolved to eat grass, which is why of course we co-evolve with cows because they can eat grass and we can't and then we can eat them and that's a kind of synergetic loop if you like. Anyway, it's the beginning of cheap meat, um, which was then shipped to the cities. Um, 
and uh, basically became the sort of the new urban food for the first time people in cities were eating loads and loads of meat rather than just grain but of course they were still eating grain it had just gone through an animal first um but grain was still supporting the city anyway there were obvious quite immediate ecological catastrophes as a result of transferring what had been grassland to monocultural grain production the famous dust bowl of the 1930s when essentially the topsoil of the whole of the midwest just kind of blew away because it was losing nutrition and no longer being kept stable by the grass and the bison and it was the beginning of a debate that's still raging today which is essentially do we feed ourselves industrially or do we feed ourselves organically and it was actually, um, so it's all about whether you, it's the living soil that you are trying to enrich in the way that you farm um, with mycorrhizal connections, which is all about how plants and soil fungi have a kind of mini exchange going on in the soil where the plants give the, the soil fungi uh, sugars that only they can make through photosynthesis. And then the soil fungi feed them nutrients and minerals directly from the soil, which the, only they can digest. Or do we have this kind of um, fast food for plants model where we just chuck fertilizers on the ground? The Harbour Bosch process, by the way, is the process by which we artificially fix nitrogen, which is thought to be responsible for feeding about two out of five people on the planet now. And so that's the basis of nitrogenous fertilizers. Justus Liebig was the German chemist who worked out that plants need principally nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, NPK, which is the basis of most of the fertilizers. Uh, Albert Howard argued, uh, he's the father of the modern organic movement, that basically if you, did, if you fed plants those chemicals, they wouldn't make these mycorrhizal connections and they would therefore become undernourished and weak. So it's a bit like feeding your, plant, you know, your kids kind of salt, sugar and fat. It's a similar thing. The plants grow big, but they don't grow healthy. Anyway, Howard was actually winning that argument. He was getting followers on both sides of the Atlantic. And then very, very tragically, this happened. I mean, tragic on every level, of course, the war. And as you can see from this rather amazing poster, you know, the whole thing was about maximizing food production by any means possible. And of course, chucking chemicals on the ground seemed like a no brainer rather than the kind of long term way of nurturing powerful connections with nature. After the war, you know, the kind of the, the New Deal was that basically everybody would have a lovely little house in the suburbs. Of course, this is all being built on prime farmland and you would have a car and you would drive yourself to the city centre, which is now um, sort of transposed into an out of city mall. This is the first ever mall built by actually a, a, an Austrian architect called Victor Bruin who discovered that if you created this kind of box in the middle of nowhere and people drove to it, they would actually walk 10 times further than they would do in an actual city center. So it's like a kind of economic magic pill. Um, and of course, if people were driving to buy their food, they were also leaving the city and the food itself was being denatured to withstand the new food logistics. Uh, and they would come back with much more than, than they would normally have done on a daily shop. Uh, and they would sort of stick half of it in the fridge and forget it was there. So it's really the birth of our sort of modern distance from food. Um, of course, what's happening now, because the food industry is control, is that the food is following the money. So this is a very interesting map that was done a couple of years ago in New York City, where basically the, the, the red areas represent what are called food deserts, which is areas of the city where there is basically no fresh food. Uh, and of course, they're the poor areas. So that's uh, the Bronx and Harlem up there. That's Eastern Brooklyn, poor areas where you have to walk more than 500 meters to get, uh, to get fresh food. So the food is no longer following the people, it's following the money. And of course, there's massive consolidation within the food industry because as the ancients knew, and we seem to have forgotten, uh, control of food is power. Uh, so now it's, it's mega corporations who control the food system and not politicians. And of course, we think of food as cheap. If you go back to that image I showed you at the beginning, I'm going to have to speed up. I just looked at the clock. Um, basically, we've predicated our entire economy on the idea that cheap food exists, but in fact, it doesn't. Uh, we've just chosen not to include 
the degradation of farmland, climate change related gases, the loss of fresh water, a diet related disease, which of course has been highlighted by COVID because most of the underlying health conditions that make us susceptible to COVID are food related, <coughs> diet related, eutrophication, which is due to excess runoff of chemical into lakes that poison the lakes. They, they basically have algae blooms and starve it of oxygen. Huge amounts of food waste because we don't value food, therefore we waste it. That's from a supermarket dumpster. Um, meat, um, this huge explosion of meat eating, we're now feeding about a third of our grain harvest, which of course is what we're really eating to animals. Um, about, and we're spending about 10 calories of energy for every calorie we consume. And of course, there's this massive decline in insect and bird life, which is directly associated both with climate change and the use of chemicals. So the world's turning into a hamburger, which is a bit of a disaster. Um, and really, I mean, I would say this is the crisis that we faced up until two and a half months ago. Um, and then, of course, this happened. <laughs> um, it's like a crisis on top of a crisis. But it's really, really interesting, COVID. And you know, I think I think one of the things that I would say about it is that it's showing us stuff that was already there in plain sight, but maybe we couldn't see. As I said at the beginning, we live in a world shaped by food, but we don't see it because we li literally wouldn't exist without food. So COVID is showing us again that you know we we are all connected um, by viruses in this case, but I mean, you know, we were already connected by, by microbes, by the small stuff, you know, for example, in the soil that we eat. Um, it also shows us that, uh, many things that may have been sort of slightly less obvious are now very obvious. So for example, our relationship with nature is out of balance. You know, we're encroaching on wild areas where we shouldn't be, and we're weakening our biodiversity, which is making it easier for these pathogens to then take a hold in our world. Um, some of you may have seen these extraordinary scenes in India when the lockdown was imposed. 45 million people in India were living in cities, but actually they, their real home was in the countryside. So this relationship between the city and the countryside is totally out of kilter. So people couldn't earn money in the countryside um, but actually they ha had a very precarious existence, day-to-day -day existence in the city. You know, this image from Bangkok I find really interesting. This is delivery kind of food, food delivery guys, socially distancing as they wait for the orders that they're then going to deliver to people who are at home. So again, you see these kind of class structures. Some people just afford to stay at home, others have to go out to work. And of course, some of you, those of you in the UK may be aware we're about 90,000 farm workers short of a harvest because most of them usually come from Romania. And of course, the fact that we can't fly and we can't move means that there's nobody to pick the fruit. And of course, English people, British people have long since stopped harvesting their own food. So that again is just a sort of a fragility that we may not have been aware of until recently. Of course, what COVID is also showing us is amazing new examples of resilience. So we're seeing new neighborliness, people baking for their neighbors. We're seeing a lot of families rediscovering the joy of actually having time to cook and being with their kids. And you know, it's very interesting that basically eggs and flour is basically what supermarkets constantly run out of. We're seeing the spontaneous generation of new, much more nimble food networks, which is really interesting, that are directly connecting small producers to consumers and a huge surge of interest in growing your own food, which by the way, always happens when there's a crisis. So these are examples of resilience that we're literally just seeing kind of coming up within the space of weeks of this lockdown, which I find really interesting. And I guess the question is, you know, which of these things are we or can we going to take forward? I think one thing that COVID is really making obvious is that it's time for a rethink. And it was time for a rethink anyway, but, you know, I mean, climate change was and is a, an ever present danger, as indeed was the, the radical loss of biodiversity that was already beginning to manifest itself as a, the sixth mass extinction. But I love this question of, of Cedric Price is a wonderful architect who didn't build very much because he was, I guess, too much of a philosopher. And he came up with a famous saying that sometimes the answer is not a building. <laughs> which is not very good for having a career if you want to build lots of stuff. But anyway, it's very honest and very true. Um, 
so this wonderful quote, technology is the answer, but what was the question? What I find really interesting about this is that, you know, it's very clear if you take the historical perspective as in a way food allows you to do, it shows you that the basic question we're asking hasn't changed. So again, as architects, the question is, how should we dwell? As I've said before, you know, if we're political animals, that question has a kind of inherent duality in it because we need the city, but we also need the countryside. If you realize that, it then becomes really interesting to look at utopian thinking because utopians are always trying to square that circle. You know, Plato and Aristotle wanted to keep the city small. Thomas More, he had the same idea. He thought, ooh, sorry, I don't know how I did that even. Um, uh, he wanted to keep the city small. He wanted to replace London with a series of semi-independent city-states that would have that oikonomia, that sort of that household management attitude of feeding themselves. And then the Garden City, which I'm sure many of you have come across, is basically the same idea. It's, I call it Thomas More with railways. It's exactly the same idea. It's basically incremental land reform, where you keep the city small, you surround it with productive uh, farmland, but you network the cities up so that you also have enough density of, of, of inhabitation to, for example, have a decent symphony orchestra or something. Now, I remember when I was researching Utopia for my first book, Hungry City, coming across the horrible discovery that Utopia is a good place that doesn't exist. <laughs> it's an ideal. Um, so it can either mean a good place from the Greek ou, meaning good, or ou, meaning no. Um, that's where the U of utopia comes from. Um, and I remember finding this really depressing because I thought, well, you know, we need a multidimensional way of thinking about how we should live. And if the, the way we've got can't exist, that's a real problem. But by then I'd already spent about seven years researching how to feed cities and I'd realised we live in a world shaped by food. So I thought, well, maybe we could come up with a practical alternative to utopia called sitopia. That just means food place from the Greek word sitos for food and topos for place. So sitopia basically recognises that food shapes our lives, it shapes our bodies, our habits, our politics, our economy, our landscapes, our cities, our houses, our streets, um, but we kind of don't see it because it basically it's everywhere. But if we take food and actually sort of look at the world through food, then it's an incredibly powerful design tool. And it's a practical alternative to utopia because we already live in it. So how does that work? Well, basically it works because you think of food as a flow going through our lives the whole time from the landscape to distribution centers, to a market, to a kitchen, to the place where we eat it, to call it the table, and then round again in an endless loop. And the way we solve each of those loops has a massive effect on the world. So do we, for example, allow cows to eat grass, which is what they evolved to do, and then we get these beautiful landscapes and a synergy, or this is a concentrated animal feeding operation, so that's 160,000 cows you're looking at, all being fed on grain, getting sick, wandering around in their own poo, being injected with antibiotics, it's generally a bad news, really bad news, it's an ecological catastrophe, as I'm sure many of you know livestock industrial livestock farming is by far the biggest um contributor in our in our farming system to climate change do we go into the middle of the city and animate it with food and meet other humans i know that seems like a distant dream under covid or do we leave the city in the name of efficiency and go to a supermarket or even just summon our food with the magic carpet of deliveroo do we take time to sit around the table eating meals? Now, again, under COVID, we've rediscovered the joy of doing this, amazingly, but it was a vanishing habit before. Indeed, before COVID, 20% of meals in America were eaten in a car, which I just find an astonishing statistic. So we were rushing around so much, we just didn't have time to stop and eat. So the question then is not which of these is, you know, kind of more efficient or cheaper or whatever, but which of these approaches to feeding ourselves is actually sitting inside some idea that we might have of a good life. So you turn it on its head. It's not about food, it's about what we think a good life is. Now, 
I have to say that I've come to the conclusion that food is the most important thing in our lives. We wouldn't be here without it. We have to produce it every day and therefore treating it as cheap is insane. So we have to revalue food. And it's very ironic that the times in history when we value food, London during the war, uh, it's Cuba after the fall of the Soviet Union, Detroit after the motor cars left, it's all times of crisis when people have immediately gone back to growing food again, as they are now under COVID, that is telling you the true value of food. Food is something, food is living things that we kill so we can live. And when you think of it like that, you realise that to cheapen food is to cheapen life. So we can't think of food as cheap. It's very, very clear that we have to work with nature and not against it. And COVID is just that, making that even more clear. We have to go back to ideas of permaculture, which is basically farming in ways that mimic nature and work with nature, like this forest garden idea, which is to mimic a forest. And it means eating less grain actually and eating more nuts and berries and things, which is actually better for us anyway. Working with the soil, I, you know, we've been 50 years on the wrong side of this argument. We have to go back to working with the soil again. And ideas like Dan Barber, Chef Dan Barber's idea of, of asking nature what it wants to feed us rather than just saying "Ooh, i want a steak for dinner where am i going to get it from we have to democratize the food system that's what the food system looks like at the moment it's monopoly with enormous food companies controlling the relationship between farmers and consumers we need to democratize the food system by joining up consumers directly again under covid this is happening why do we have to do that because as i said earlier control of food is power if we want to live in a democracy, we can't have a monopolistic food system, just stands to reason. So we have to co-produce, and this is an idea that Carlo Petrini, who was the founder of the slow food movement, came up with. It means not just being passive consumers of food, but actually going out and having, getting involved in feeding ourselves. So maybe supporting a community supported agriculture farm, CSA, like this one outside Chicago where city dwellers pay farmers in advance to feed them and maybe even go and work on the farm, which is actually quite fun uh, and gets you out of the city, gets you in contact with nature again. Food co-ops like this one that's been going now for nearly 50 years in Brooklyn, where you, you join the co-op and you work a certain number of hours in the shop uh, and then get your food a lot cheaper and they have a lot of long-term relationships with local farmers, local to New York. Uh, organic box schemes kind of speaks for itself guerrilla gardening, this idea that we replant the city with food. This is where it gets very, very uh, architectural. We have to reincorporate food in the way we imagine the places we live. So although you can't feed a city from within itself, and this is a really important point, and this is why vertical farms, by the way, are not the answer, you can grow fruit and veg. Think back to the von Thunen model, that inner ring of fruit and veg, that you can grow in the city, but the rest of the food, the grain, the pulses, the meat, if you're going to eat it, has to come from elsewhere. Nevertheless, by growing food in the city, we reacquaint ourselves with the, what, how valuable and how precious food is, and the joy of growing a plant yourself is transformative. Embedding it in governance, like the Toronto Food Policy Council does, so that every decision we make has a food-based element in it. Farmers markets speak for themselves infrastructure in the countryside if we're going to farm with nature we we have to stop using monocultures we have to go back to using mixed farms regenerative farming animals are a natural part of that and we can discuss that i'm sure some of you want to discuss that but with organic farming some a small number of animals are important therefore we need infrastructure such as local abattoirs small-scale abattoirs food hubs in the city where all of this can come together, the idea of patchwork farms. So you grow food in the city as well as outside the city. Very, very importantly at the next scale up, it's also about achieving an urban rural balance. So what does a modern Lawrence city look like? If you go back to that image I started with, again, this is not a new idea. Patrick Geddes in the early 20th century was talking about preserving areas of countryside so that when cities develop, they developed into star shapes. So you still remain very close to the countryside, even if you're in a big city. Architects like Bern and Viljan are pro uh, proposing re-inhabiting the city with productive land. So turning car parks and stuff into orchards and then joining them up to get fingers of countryside 
coming back to the city, interrogating the productive hinterland of a city like this study done outside New York to see what could be grown for the city and how you can strengthen those connections. So kind of bioregionalism and the scheme by MVRDV in Almera where they're basically sort of encouraging people to have food production as well as dwellings. I mean, I think for me, going back to that idea that the, the shared problem of how to eat is how we evolved as a species, it remains our biggest question. For me, the best metaphor for a good society is one in which everybody eats well, and we all eat together. You know, every day we're eating not only with all other humans on the planet, but all other non-humans on the planet. So the act of eating is, for me, the most powerful moment when we really do connect with the physical world. And a good meal, a good food, makes the world a better place. It builds a better Zootopia. It means landscapes flourish. They don't get denuded. People are paid properly to feed us. They're not treated like slaves. Animals are, have a good life. They're not abused and so on. If we all eat well, everything else follows. It all follows from food. So I want to offer you food as a tool for thinking through, designing through and building a better world through. It's not about food, oddly, it's about the world seen through the lens of food. So I'd like to encourage you to put on your pineapple shaped glasses, see the world through food and together we can build a better Zootopia post COVID. Thank you very much. And that's um, my recent book that Jean kindly mentioned, which in which I talk about all of this at even greater length. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much, Carolyn. It was really, really amazing. Um, I'm going to open the floor for questions now. So if you just want to write them in the chat uh, box or whatever it's called, and I'll select them. But maybe I can start with a question from me. Um, I think that a really interesting aspect is also how food creates different relations between people, whether it's people who are inside the city and the people who are outside, because I'm French and what think was something that has been highlighted in the past few years is through the crisis of the Gilets Jaunes is how the exploitation of the countryside and therefore of the people who actually farm the land and feed us is just not sustainable. And yeah. I think that your ideas on the fact that we should maybe grow our food more and have it more incorporated within the lives of the city rather than having this duality with, between country and cities is super interesting and I think it's something for sure that is currently being discussed in universities and it's obviously uh, just the way to go at the moment whether I mean and always yeah no thank you very much for that and actually you reminded me I didn't say maybe the most important thing but hopefully it was implied which is that I think we need to internalize the true cost of food which means there would be no such thing as cheap food anymore there isn't anyway as I tried to explain in other words we've created the illusion of cheap food by externalizing its its true costs if we internalize the true cost of food, industrial livestock production, for example, would instantly become totally unaffordable because it is unaffordable. It's, it's unethical, it's unecological and so on. But it's this illusion that we have created to make us think that, that food can be cheap. And it is very much an urban rural thing because unfortunately, even if you go back 500 years, cities have had all the power, cities have written the narratives, cities are where the money all is. And even in the, those very, very early cities, right back in ancient Mesopotamia, um, very rapidly the temples got rich and the farmers were treated a bit like slaves. So I think what's interesting about the Lawrence Setti image and the reason I'm so kind of, you know, obsessed with it in a way, is that it does to me represent the ideal. It is a utopian vision, but it's also a sitopian vision because it's all about food. The countryside and the city need to exist in harmony and in balance. And so I think, you know, now probably with COVID again, with, you know, it's, it's a, a very, very important moment when we can say we can no longer afford to think of food as cheap. We have to pay people properly to feed us. You know, I think we discovered that the true value of so-called key workers who are always the least well paid in society. And that then brings on an immediately another question, which is, oh, but then what about all the pe poor people in society? And then you say, but that is the problem. You know, they deserve to eat well too. So why do we pay care workers, nurses, you know, security guards, not enough to live on? We need a more equal society. So you then begin to get a kind of a food-based economy, you know, one based around real value, what really matters, which is kind of, 
being fed well, being healthy, looking after people, rather than, you know, all the things basically making money for its own sake, which ironically, you know, Aristotle warned against two and a half thousand years ago, because he said, you never achieve balance when, when you're trying to, to just make more money, because there's no such thing as enough money, whereas there is such a thing as enough food. So yes, absolutely right. I think it's time for a new social contract between the feeders and the fed. Um, so we're getting a few questions on the chat. There's one that I think is quite interesting actually, and that I would know your thoughts on as well, from Prabhat, who is asking your thoughts on veganism and vegetarianism. Yeah, no, it's a really important question. I mean, I, obviously I'm an architect, so I'm not an agronomist, so I have to go on the basis of other people's work. I've read a huge amount about this. And I think in order, what I would say is, it's very, very clear to me that it's really important that we start farming as organically as we can. Because as I was saying briefly before, chucking chemicals on the ground, it, it just, it kills nature and it is killing nature. And actually I would argue that the mass extinction, which is underway now, is more of an ecological threat even than climate change. And of course, they're related because climate change is part of it. Okay, so we have to go back to working with nature. What does that mean? Well, as ever with these things, you just have to look historically at what people did. I was speaking briefly earlier on about recycling night soil. So that's human and animal manure going on the land and being recycled in and out of the city. We have to go back to these kinds of principles. Why did we co-evolve with pigs, chickens, goats, and so on, cows? Because we could maximize the productivity of the land by using those animals. Until industrialization, people ate very, very little meat. Why? Because it was extremely expensive and difficult to produce. And in fact, meat was a seasonal food because at the end of the summer, most of the animals were slaughtered because there was no way of keeping them going through the winter because they weren't fed on fodder crops. And actually it was the Dutch who invented the principle of growing fodder crops to feed your animals explicitly. Now, I think we need to go back to that kind of model. So I think we need an organic plant focused way of farming. Um, if you look at how to farm regeneratively, it's all about mixed farms. You know, it's not monoculture. Nature is never a monoculture. It's about smaller scale farms. It's about much more human intervention on the landscape, so more farmers. And it's about a relationship, a complete sort of ecosystem, which is animals and plants. And for example, I mean, I think, I, I don't know whether you've heard about Nepa State in, in um, Sussex, but you know, Nepa State is a, used to be a kind of, a, sorry, I'm, 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 I mean, this is a whole other lecture, I'm suddenly, <laughs> um, I, okay, cut to the chase. Um, you need animals in the system, but just not very many. So my, my take on veganism is if somebody wants to be a vegan for ethical reasons or ecological reasons, I think that's absolutely brilliant. I take my hat off to you. But actually, for most people, I think we need, it's fine to have a mostly plant-based diet and to treat meat and dairy as a luxury, which is basically going back to how we used to farm, because actually we need animals in the farm system. They, they, they actually keep wild landscapes under control by you know pigs rootling in the forest etc and as i was saying earlier cows can eat grass and we can eat the cows the number of animals that we'd have in the system would the methane problem is is actually tiny it kind of goes away if you farm like that it's only when you've got you know more farm animals than humans that it, it becomes the problem that it is um and you know pigs and chickens is a no-brainer because basically they eat food waste you know, they can eat our food waste and they can, they can eat things we can't eat. And, and so I think they belong in the system too. And, but it's just, it's few animals treated well, treated with respect and, but also part of an organic system. And most importantly, you need them in the, in the manure. You know, I mean, they, they're, they're really critical for an organic system in terms of recycling the nutrients. So that's what I think. Great. Thank you. Um, um, I that? think, um, Jean, sorry. Because I think uh, there's a question coming from Max, which has to do with the division between city and land, city and countryside. Uh, I'm going to unmute um, Max, if that's okay. Max, um, you had a really great question. Cool. Thanks, Eugene. Um, Caroline, for the, for the chat, uh, for the talk. Um, 
I guess my question has to do with um, the sort of fundamental division between the city and countryside and how, as you said, the city has sort of historically um, dominated and exploited the, the country. Um, and whether the sort of move to a more sort of equitable society uh, where a new social contract might be forged um, is in a sort of spatial condition of, of suburbia and whether there's potential in um, a sort of suburban landscape as one where people obviously have access to land at, um, at, at, at sort of reason as a, a, a re at the scale of sort of community or, or, or um, yeah and are better sort of positioned to maybe take control over these sort of basic tenets of life which is obviously growing food and sort of having control over resources like water and other basic necessities I think it's something that I haven't read the book but David Holmgren one of the sort of founders of modern oh, culture yeah 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 no, I think it's a really, thank you so much. It's a very, very interesting question. I mean, I, and I, again, something else I forgot to say, but I hope it's implied. I, the form, formulation I've come up with, if you like, is what we need to do is maximise the urban-rural interface. But this can happen at any scale. So as you rightly say, suburbia does that because if you like, the house represents the city in a sense, the garden represents the countryside. So at the scale of a plot of land, you have that connection. Um, and in fact, you know, for a long time, suburbia was absolutely touted as the best of both worlds because you had the city and the countryside. Mm. I think, you know, the reason why suburbia fails in a sense is that most people who live in suburbia don't work in suburbia. You know, so you have this massive transport issue. But of course, as COVID is now showing, that may not be the future. It may be that with COVID, we can actually live and work in suburbia that, that changes the game considerably. But I mean, in terms of this, this formula, and in my head, it looks like a fractal. You know, at the scale of a city region, it's about the city and its hinterland having powerful connections. At the scale of an urban block, it's maybe about, you know, a block of flats having allotments. At the scale of a house, it's exactly as you say, it's about people growing stuff in their garden. At the scale of a flat or something, it might be having a balcony or even a window box where you can grow herbs, you know. So everywhere, I mean, I think, and, and again, yet another thing I didn't get around to saying, I seem to have spoken for a long time not to have said a lot of stuff, but anyway, um, Aristotle's um, term political animals, I think is really interesting because as I said at the beginning, in order to be happy, we need these two things that are in a way apparently opposed. We need society and we need nature. And for me, the most interesting and the most challenging design question in a sense is, you know, what does a landscape look like for human flourishing? You know, because it, in, it has to involve elements of both of those, but there's an infinity of ways of incorporating them but not recognizing that need, not recognizing that dualism is the mistake. And I think that's what a lot of urban centric thinking does. Mm -hmm. It forgets our need for nature and it forgets that we need to eat, you know? So I'm trying to redress the balance in a way, but absolutely I think, you know, suburbia is a fantastically interesting study. And I say, particularly in the age now that we've discovered, oh, we don't actually have to get on a train and travel into an office every day, hallelujah. So mm -hmm. that could be a really interesting new development. Thanks for the question. Thanks, Kevin. Thank you, Jim. Um, I'm not sure there's any, I mean, there's a lot of questions, so we won't be able to go through all of them, but... Um, I mean, if people are... want to, I mean, if you want to send me a list, I'm happy to just answer them and then you can... Yeah, answer um, I don't know, Yijin, you told me Samir has a question, but I can't see it coming uh, in the chat. So maybe okay. We... Um, Maybe we could unmute him. Samir, I've yeah. unmuted you if you have a question. Hello, maybe it's easier, yeah. If I, uh, thank you for the great talk. I was very interested when you were mentioning about food becoming invisible after the railways um, and this kind of whole effect on uh, kind of uh, grain monoculture and uh, like being a result of basically the supply chain and the whole logistic um, problem. Do you, but do you see uh, this kind of invisibility as a problem? Do you see, uh, do you think that 
one of the solution may be would be to kind of make this whole process maybe visible or more like or is it a question of proximity because you mentioned like how uh, would be integrated maybe in the city this kind of whole food production system uh, do you see like going back to maybe a, a system where we're kind of completely in this do you see do you think this would be a yeah i do and i mean again it's it's so nice to be talking to architects because we do think in the same way and i mean absolutely yet another thing that i really do think very strongly that i probably didn't say clearly enough i absolutely think we have to make food visible again and, and that's what I was saying about that, that, you know, the image of the guy growing all those veggies on his roof. I mean, he's yeah. actually, that's Brooklyn Grange Farm, I should have said, it's the first farm in New York to get permission to turn back from an industrial to an agricultural use. And he's had something like 80,000 school kids through there. You know, he's had just insane numbers of school kids there. So, so, and the kids just love it because they re-encounter you know, what a plant is, you know, and plants are amazing things. We wouldn't be here without them, you know, so I think that's really, really important. And yes, I mean, part of my vision, I mean, it's quite interesting. I haven't really designed anything for about 20 years, but I mean, I'm actually getting to the point where I almost want to pick up a pencil and start drawing stuff because I really think we need to make spaces for food in the city again. And I think we need to replace what the market used to be and by the way, with COVID again, I mean, I find it really disturbing that people are starting to say, oh, you know, we, we don't need to travel and we don't need to be together. I think those are fundamental human needs. They don't obviously have to be in the city centre. I mean, we could build these new centres in suburbia, actually. But I think food hubs where people come together, you know, maybe to grow, maybe to cook and also sort of just to have spaces, community spaces where we can get together. It's a really natural thing. I think, again, COVID has, pr 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 you know, sort of proved that we we really respond to that kind of neighbourhood scale of, of encounter. Um, and, you know, I think, you know, for me, rethinking the world through food is very much about saying, OK, what, what do we need to be happy? I mean, a whole load of stuff I didn't have time to get into today, but it's really, really interesting is the anarchists and the way they were thinking about, you know, a society based not around division of labor where everyone just sticks a pin on you know the, the head on a pin and that's all they do all day and then they just consume to co compensate themselves in the evening but a society based around every human having a rounded life you know and that has many many implications again for the way we design spaces so that you know maybe they're kind of mixed communities where you there's live work units there's places to grow there's workshops there's you know there's, there's possibilities for living a very rich life in a particular place with a mixture of private and shared spaces, that kind of thing. So I think the visibility of food, I think active engagement in food is a really fundamental part of that. And it's what you would call the low hanging fruit because we all have to eat every day. And food is a physical thing and it occupies real space. And this is why I'm not into the, you know, let's grow meat in labs type thing. I mean, apart from the weirdness of all of that, let's not even go there uh, and Google owning my food. No, thank you very much. But also it, it I think we have a fundamental need as humans to be creative and productive and in a world where most of our jobs are getting robotized food is just a perfect perfect place where we can do real stuff again and again with COVID we're seeing people going oh you know I'm actually rather enjoying baking bread you know <laughs> um so yeah I absolutely on every possible level yes to your question I think it's a very special problem if you think about it I mean I think about the first diagram you showed the yeah. simplified the circle. Yeah. Well, funny enough, funny you should ask that. But since since this is the wonder of Zoom, I can show you a diagram I was drawing really early. So this is the diagram from which my book came. By the way, it's just a sketch, but it's how food sits in our world. So it's yeah. so, and then a table, people around the table, a cook figure, a market sitting in the city in the countryside. That's the structure of the book. But on the back of the same piece of paper, weirdly, because I didn't know how important that drawing would become. It's, I'm trying to work out the geometrical problem. If, if red is city and green is countryside, how do you bring those two together? So this is what we do at the moment. We just build cities and say the food will come in from mm -hmm. Brazil. But this is the, the kind of the city state model. And this is if you like, I didn't talk about it today, but this is kind of the Frank Lloyd Wright Broadacre city. In fact, the guy just before you was asking about suburbia. That's the suburban model where everyone has a little house and a little, a little farm. So, and, and none of them's ideal, you know, but, but weirdly, because that one's kind of nearer the middle, the city state model, 
it's the one I think that has the most possibility, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. You know, so I'm very drawn to this as, as, a, as, a, as a concept. Um, but it doesn't have to take that shape, of course. Um, anyway, since you asked. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thanks for coming. <laughs> All right, unfortunately, I think we have to leave it at that. I'll, I'll send you some of the questions that we've gotten because some of them are really interesting. Again, thank you so much for the lecture. It was really, really amazing. It was so great to be able to have you. Thank you. Thank you.